And I'd like to um, really uh, pause with a big, such a big sense of gratitude to Patty for making this possible. I'm just feeling so privileged myself to be here and to listen to Kim and Belinda. It's been an absolute joy. This is so much, so close to my heart, this topic. And um, in fact, listening to Kim and Belinda, there's so much I can cross out in my talk now because <laughs> you've, you've covered some of the key topics that I was going to speak about. But actually, I've, and ever since Patty brought this up in a board meeting, the concept of this um, pod, my mind has just been, you know, isn't it lovely the way your unconscious mind just chews the card, <laughs> just works away in the background? I, I love the way that happens. And even this morning, um, because, you know, I'm a teacher, I have a lesson plan, um, but I was actually thinking what came to me this morning was these incredible memories. And I, I'd love to know, I wish we had more time because I'd love to hear from all of you, um, you know, who are with us for this, this event. When you think about your childhood, what are the really precious memories? Because I know that some of mine are nature-based. And I grew up in a bit of a ramshackle house in inner in Melbourne. And fortunately, my parents were quite eccentric. <laughs> I grew up with a, a cockatoo, galahs, budgies, cats, and my mother bred dogs. So we had lots of litters. And, it just, and we had a rambling garden with a big mulberry tree. But one of the most magical things about our yard was it had a really run-down garage at the back, and we could climb onto the roof. And overhanging this garage was a peppercorn tree. And I don't know, Belinda, if they released those um, chemicals you were talking about, but it was just heaven. It was heaven sitting under this tree and just looking out to the sky. And one, I, I'm really struggling with a bit of grief, <laughs> ongoing grief, because I think you quoted, Patty, um, Richard Louf, and I, I, that's one of the books in my library. Um, and I think he was one that coined the term nature deficit disorder. Because in my work with children, and I've been working in this, well, I've been working with children for most of my life because I was an art teacher before I became a full-time mindfulness and meditation teacher, but I'm, I'm quite stunned by what's happened from what I've seen in experience in Melbourne in my lifetime. Because when I grew up, I think council regulations were that houses could not take up more than 60% of the block. So 40% was basically garden and that has gone in Melbourne. It, it just breaks my heart. Where I, I, it's a funny situation for me because I live in East Q and Fortunately, we are, we've got the Yarra River walking distance and we've got green belts, but the land, I feel it's being raped, I'm sorry. Every time a house goes down, the first thing they do is literally take 100 years of soil away. They take it away and they build this monolith of their, first of all, they have a concrete basement and they put this massive house and the children, sometimes have plastic lawns and they have spiky plants and they have a lot of paving. And so how can they have magical spots to commune with nature in their own? And, and, you know, some children don't live in areas where there are many, you know, green patches. And so it breaks my heart really. And I, working with children um, as I do, you know, I, I know that well, I'm aware of statistics around the number of children with ADD and ADHD, and a lot of them are being medicated. Um, and, you know, Kim, if only they could take off their shoes and, and Belinda and, you know, sit under a tree instead of... So it's... And I, I'm finding um, that the older I get, the more I do this work, 
the greater the passion is to try and commute. And I wish politicians were tuning into this afternoon. I wish policymakers and people in you know hierarchy of education because this is really crucial. And when you think about it, if we aren't aware of something, if we don't know about something, we don't care about it. It's not on our radar. So there's a lot of children growing up in a situation that is increasingly divorced from their mother kin, from their origins. And unfortunately in my work, because I'm a consultant, and I work all over the place and I get, you know, I, for a lot of children, I get to see them once. I do sample lessons. I train staff and I go in and I introduce. So what I'm increasingly finding is I take nature into the classroom. I, our garden, um, I, I live with my partner is actually has a background in, in um, landscaping and plant propagation. So we've got a whole range of herbs and actually really interesting plants that we grow that are amazing in, to touch them, to smell them, to feel them, and even put them on your face. Um, even things like pineapple sage, you know, you can't believe it, it smells like pineapple. So that amazes children. So there, and of course there are so many opportunities to, take kids out into nature but and there's so many wonderful things simple effortless things they can do like lie on their back on the grass and watch clouds I mean, isn't that the most wonderful thing watch the skyscape and we know i mean i have learned from my great many great meditation teachers including rick, most recently rick hansen he's one of my absolute favorites and um, that when we open when we let go of an intense focus and we just soft gaze and of course nature invites us to do that it actually changes the whole functioning of the brain it literally just like opens curtains but for some children they are so disconnected from nature they won't necessarily immediately connect to that so therefore, it's great to have a whole lot of engaging opportunities. And really what I'm looking to do is to cultivate curiosity because you want them to be leaning in and being curious. So when they go into nature, it's fantastic if you can to take magnifying glasses because that sort of tunes them in and and for some of these children that have trouble you know with it they're regulating or focusing their attention boy does this focus their attention they can't resist it really um but then if you don't uh have your wherewithal to get a whole lot of these this is something that i do in the classroom because i don't necessarily unfortunately but that may change as my life changes take them outside and, you know, even in schools, you know, some schools have ripped out all the grass and put in plastic grass. <laughs> Just, um, so that's, the, you know, the situation for some children. So I actually, with recycled cardboard, this is just, you know, I, I keep bits of like, this had a, I think it had a pillowcase. <laughs> and so you can just cut out a square, that's four centimetres. And when you do that with children, they can't help but start looking through them. <laughs> and, and when you start tuning in like that, they really start to become engaged. And what they can discover is that in nature, there is no such thing as anything being ordinary. Things that man comes up with can be pretty ordinary, I find <laughs> things that man has created especially when it's mass produced and it's sort of generic but anything that nature creates can take our breath away and I'm going to give you I mean I've just been walking around the garden before <laughs> we can't hear you when you move away from the microphone just okay, so you know we don't want to miss some, anything thanks Patty I've just got some whole lot of stuff here so if you take a, something as simple as a cornflower I mean, you know, and you start looking at it, 
it is absolutely spellbinding. <laughs> so you can you can get it doesn't even even ahead of native grass is quite amazing. And I found myself lately because I used to I still do I have a big black bag and I have all sorts of because I actually want I never use PowerPoint slides with children. I literally get their hands on things, smelling, touching, feeling. Um, you know, look at a pansy close up. I mean, it's just incredible. I don't know if you can see that, but well, the lighting's probably not good enough. But, and I, I just loved your quotes, Patty. Could you please send them to me? I couldn't write quickly enough. Um, I've chosen Einstein quotes. And Einstein says, said, look deeply into nature and you will understand everything better. When you think about our well-being, nature, as, as Kim was saying about, you know, all this and Belinda, the, the chemicals that nature shares, uh, the, the food that nature shares, but there's even more than that. If we just start focusing on nature, we learn what we really need to learn about in life, like that things change, nothing's stuck, nothing's fixed. The seasons, some seasons will be dark and cold, then they change and the sun comes out. You know, the weather teaches us things. So there are so many lessons that nature just effortlessly, and what, there's so many points that Belinda and Kim made that I had written in my notes. And one of the challenges for children now is that so much of their lives is kind of contained by technology and busyness. And a lot of children's lives are very heavily scheduled. I was so fortunate. I had a free range childhood. My parents didn't even know where we were. We'd turn up for meals when we were hungry. And we did. Um, but now children just don't live like that. Their, their lives are very controlled and structured. And so when we connect to nature, we get this incredible sense that we're part of something much bigger than any, there's nothing limited in nature. It's limitless, it's expansive, um, and it's also miraculous. And there are some wonderful ideas um, to engage children outside, apart from obviously forest bathing and uh, lying on the grass and watching clouds, looking up, I love doing that, just lying down and looking up to a tree and just watching the leaves move and listening to that sound. But a fun little thing to do is just get an old lid. Doesn't matter what the lid is, a you know, decent sized plastic, um, the tray of a plant pot or put it on a bit of dirt and come back in a week and see what's happening under that lid. <laughs> because inevitably, and of course some children will find this confronting if they don't like bugs, and, or even to dig a hole, dig a hole in the earth and just with a magnifying glass and just be amazed by what you will discover. So all these little things help children shift their perspective. It's an effortless way to counter self-obsession. And there seems to be a lot of that. And self-obsession is enough to drive you bonkers, isn't it? Constantly focusing or being narcissistic. And is you know, it's just very hard to bear. But actually being able to connect to others and the bigger picture and to nature helps you is as exactly as Kim was saying, to be part of something that is awe inspiring, that's uplifting, that is, and we feel connected to, and that is our life. It gives a much bigger picture of our life than a computer screen could ever give. And so I've got more bits and pieces, I've got a whole tray down here. And um, so when you're teaching nature connection inside, there are so many ideas. And be before I forget, I always think when you have a thought in your head, you better grab it because many others are going to follow. If you'd like to visit my website later, which is uh, meditationcapsules.com, 
I, this is such a passion. I've actually got a free downloadable resource for ideas to share with children. So you can um, please uh, go and visit my website if you're interested, because I, I can't, I, I can't talk about them all now, but I've got a few ideas that I might not mention now. But if you're doing it, if you want to draw attention to nature inside, there's limitless opportunities. And here's one of them. I mean, oh gee, this is a bit small. Right here, I've got a little container of mung beans here. <laughs> it's so small. They're enough to crack your teeth, really. <laughs> if you actually have you ever, you wouldn't want to put one in your mouth because they're like bullets they're like and so I do this with children and we actually put them in a jar and I prepared for this of course and all you have to do is leave them soaking overnight in water and you can't believe how they transform so here they are that was one tablespoon of mung beans yesterday and they're all ready. It's not that warm in Melbourne either, I might say. Can you see that they're, they're sprouting? So here's a huge lesson that nature gives us, that there's this life force and it's found everywhere. And all it takes is the right conditions for growth. And, you know, there's so, such a huge incidence of mental illness in our society. And, and again, uh, and I've been there, I've been hospitalized for mental illness. And I remember how narcissistic I was. I mean, I, that was just a time in my life. And, you know, nature just teaches us, as Einstein says, all that we need to learn. And then we can start looking at I mean, I, I'm a bow bird. You should see what a mess my office is. I've just got stuff everywhere because I, I love to, it, apparently the brain loves novelty and I only get one crack with a lot of children. I've literally only got 50 minutes to try and get them leaning in and experiencing something. And children is that, well, you know, they say people won't remember what you said necessarily, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I want them to feel curious and I want them to start making their own discoveries. And I've got a whole tray here of, it's an extraordinary how diverse seeds are in nature. So look at that, you know, and you know, strip, I'm pretty sure, I don't know what that is. I didn't get round to asking Peter before, but look at these. I mean, aren't they amazing? So there's, and I just love, native examples of seed pots. I mean, they're just bewitching. I just adore them. And fortunately where I live, there's lots of these kind of things. They just take my breath away. And I love to show, and you know, who remembers when I was a child, one of our Christmas activities, we used to make robins out of these. I don't know if this rings a bell for anybody, but we used to put cotton wool that was dyed red and you made a kind of little robin as a Christmas decoration. But isn't it extraordinary to start looking at the diversity of, in fact, the abundance that nature provides? And as Kim said, it it has this incredible force and generosity. And the problem is what we do. The problem is how we block it. And it really is time for us to address that situation. And, then another, and of course, acorns. At this time of the year in Melbourne, there, there are multi, in fact, one of my friends lives in Hamilton. <laughs> And he's got an oak tree in his garden. He says he has to wear a bike helmet uh -huh. <laughs> crashing down on his head when he's trying to garden. But it's just astonishing. I actually looked at, I Googled this, how many acorns an oak tree has. It's something that is, in, I've actually forgotten, I did it a while ago. There's something like thousands, one oak tree. So this life force, this opportunity for growth, this opportunity for regeneration knows no limits in nature and the other thing 
there are a lot of questions. And um, here's another thing that nature reminds us of. So if you look at that, you could think, well, so what? It just looks like a pretty ugly um, sort of a rock. But if you turn it over and it's, well, this one's been polished, but it's crystal. It has crystals. And, we, and now, of course, I've got a more, because um, I sometimes classes of 30 kids, so they wouldn't see that. Well, you can see this. I think it's that breathtaking. You look at the back of it and you wouldn't even pause to be curious about it, but look what lies within. And, you know, that's what meditation offers us, to actually get below the surface, to drop out of our stories and our dramas and our habits, our mental habits, to start to discover that there can be a sanctuary inside, a wondrous, extraordinary opportunity. And nature's full of it. And there are so many examples of this. So um, I could go waffling on for ages. So I think, um, and another quote from Einstein, which is along the lines of what Belinda's been saying, Kim's been saying, is he said, our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And I must say, I've had some extraordinary experiences that have blown me away with children because I, whenever I can, I take nature to them and I take flowers and things from my garden and herbs and I've, I, I work with some pretty uh, wealthy schools, so sort of privileged, well, so-called privileged in some ways, they're lacking in some experiences, but I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm, I find it breathtaking how they get excited by sitting down and smelling and looking at and, and connecting to herbs, just herbs and flowers. In fact, I even had two boys facing each other. I had a hydrangeas and one of them was clutching this flower and the other one was actually crying, they were quite young. And I said, what's happening here? <laughs> one that was had tears said, he won't share the rose. <laughs> so so it, it is just, um, Children almost seem to have it, most of them have an innate sense of realizing there's something wondrous about nature. So it's such an incredible privilege to bring it into their lives. And whenever I work in a school, I'm always trying whenever I can to convince them to rip up some plastic grass. <laughs> I've been trying for 20 years to get a school and I still haven't succeeded, unfortunately to make a sensory walking path, you know, for, with sand and um, maybe chamomile lawn and with things around it, but I'm not giving up. I met my star sign is Taurus. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of bull in me will keep on trying. And the need is so great because our future really depends on people awakening to nature and learning its lessons and having reverence and awe and gratitude. So I think I've probably used up my allocated time. So if there's any, um, and I think I've, oh, no, I haven't done the practice. How long have I got? Um, go ahead, go ahead. I thought we should really, um, it'd be nice to do a practice. And I was going to try and use music, but I'm rather than new to presenting on Zoom. I've just freeloaded on other people's presentations. And I haven't had success with, try, with, with any attempt I've had to try and share music. The quality hasn't been very good. I was going to give you a beautiful experience of an amazing piece of music, which I'll put in the chat, by the way. It's, it's called Deep Peace by Bill Douglas. It's actually a Celtic blessing. I heard it when I was on... on listening to the radio in the car and it was so stunning, I pulled over, turned off the car. 
and wrote it down on a supermarket docket and I listen to it a lot now. Um, but I'd like to invite you just for a few minutes to actually stand up. I'm going to show you how I use nature metaphors with mindful movement leading into a meditation. So if you'd like to stand up, and we don't have to have music. It's lovely to support this with music. It doesn't matter. So first of all, plant your feet. And you might need to actually have a bit of a shake. You've been sitting for a long time if you haven't been. And this is a really good quick stretch. Bring your hands together and lift up and create some space between your vertebrae. And then just let go on that out breath with a sigh. And now we're going to do a little, a, a couple of Qigong practices. And so much of yoga and so much of Qigong is inspired by nature. So the first one is we're going to cross our hands like this, drop them in front of the body, bend the knees, the back step, stay straight. Just imagine for a moment that your head is floating over your body like it's a balloon letting all tension drop out of your shoulders, head floating, and a big, slow breathing in. And this one is called dissolving the clouds and letting go of the out-breath. Crossing over the other hand, breathing in, and a sigh as you let your hands drop. And then I love doing this with children. This one is called painting the rainbow. So both hands, doesn't matter which side, breathing in, let your hands paint a rainbow and out to the other side. And then breathing in, hands floating over and out to the other side. And then bring your hands back to the center Breathing in star hands. Let those stars lift up into space. Breathing out cloud hands. Just let them float back down. Breathing in star hands. Sigh and just feel the hands softly float. And now they're going to actually meet. Thumbs meeting and they're turning into a dove. And your dove hands are coming to land on your heart. And then you can just return to your seat with your dove hands on your heart. Let your feet ground back to the earth and letting your spine hold you in place. And just letting your eyes softly close and creating a quiet space for your body to settle. And as the body settles all by itself, becoming aware of your dove hands resting over your heart space and letting your breath breathe you. Nothing you have to do, nothing you have to change as your body breathes you and just Noticing it slowing down, settling. And with every in-breath and with every out-breath, just letting your body, mind and spirit unite returning to a natural, effortless state of balance and harmony.
And when you're ready, just letting the breath deepen and gradually in your own time, bringing your attention, your awareness back to the room. Thank you for sharing that practice.